Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankel, Overview and Analysis. Frankel was born in 1905 in Vienna in Austria-Hungary. Before Frankel was sent to the Nazi concentration camps, he had a prominent role in the University of Vienna where he studied both psychiatry and neurology. His studies specialised in suicide and depression and it focused on the psychology that governed these issues and how those suffering could overcome their situation of anguish. Frankel showed his compassion and his goodwill when, from 1928 to 1930, he voluntarily counselled high school students in order to help relieve them of the emotional stress and suicidal thoughts that had become an issue at the school. After Frankel's work with the students, suicide was completely eliminated from the school. This was a major achievement for both Frankel and for the well-being of the students, and bear in mind, Frankel did all of this free of charge. He then went on to become head of the suicide department at the General Hospital of Vienna from 1933 to 37, where he treated over 3,000 women with suicidal tendencies and ultimately saved thousands of lives. It was in 1942 when Frankel, his wife and his parents were all arrested and sent to their first concentration camp, Theresienstadt, situated in the north of Czechoslovakia. Within only six months of their arrival at the camp, Frankel's father died there from pulmonary edema, where the lungs fill with fluid and eunomia, both of which were caused by the excruciating and exhausting conditions of camp life. In the camp, Frankel did as much as he could to help his fellow inmates. He established a suicide watch and helped new people entering the camp to overcome the extreme shock and grief that would accompany them upon their arrival. Two years later, in 1944, Frankel and his wife Tilly were transported away from Theresienstadt, and Frankel was moved to Auschwitz, and Tilly was moved to a camp called Bergen-Belsen in the north of Germany, where she was killed, both her and her unborn child. Frankel's brother, Walter, and his mother, Elsa, were both killed at Auschwitz. Frankel and his sister were now the only two who were still alive in the family. Frankel was then moved to Kaufering in southern Germany on the 25th of October 1945, where he spent five months working as a slave. He then went on to Turkheim, a camp very close to Kaufering, and ended up working as a physician until the 27th of April 1945, when the camp was liberated by American soldiers. Man's Search for Meaning was written by Frankel in 1946, and the book is split into two main parts. Part 1 is titled Experiences in a Concentration Camp, where he writes about his own personal experiences, the reactions of inmates upon entering the camp. Here, he identifies three main stages. The first is the extreme shock during the initial admission phase to the camp. The second is complete apathy. And lastly, there is depersonalization, where one is seen to give up. Also, Frankel gives us an insight into how we can continue to find meaning for our life, even in the midst of extreme suffering. In part two, titled Logotherapy in a Nutshell, Frankel introduces what has been come to known as the third Viennese school of psychotherapy, the first being Freud's psychoanalysis, and the second is Adler's individual psychology. Frankel's theory is founded upon the belief that human nature is motivated by the search for a life purpose. Logotherapy is the pursuit of meaning for one's life that can ultimately heal them from their melancholy and their existential angst. One of the main lessons to be learnt from man's search for meaning is that even in great suffering and after everything has been taken from a man, they still possess their internal freedom and ability to choose their attitude in any given set of circumstances. He states, It is a finite freedom, a limited freedom, that is to say a human being is never fully free from conditions, but the ultimate freedom always remains reserved to ourselves. That is the freedom to take a stand to whatever conditions might confront us. How we react to the unchangeable conditions is up to ourselves. If we cannot change a situation, we've always the last freedom to change our attitude to that situation. Frankel goes on to tell us stories of men in the camp who were still willing, despite having lost practically everything, to give away their final piece of bread to other inmates. 
This shows that despite losing virtually every material possession that they once had, they still, they still retain that inner spiritual freedom that allows them to show love and compassion towards their fellow men. The essence of this idea of freedom and suffering is summarised well in the phrase, when we are no longer able to change a, si change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. For it shows us that it is our inner freedom that is core to our nature as human beings, and it gives us the capacity to show love and compassion to those around us who may also be suffering. And there were always choices to make. Every day, every hour, offered the opportunity to make a decision, a decision which determined whether you would or would not submit to those powers which threatened to rob you of your very self, your inner freedom, which determined whether or not you would become the plaything of circumstance, renouncing freedom and dignity to become moulded into the form of the typical inmate. This shows us that it is important that we maintain the inner strength to be able to choose our attitude to the given set of circumstances. If one does this, then their suffering can be viewed as a genuine inner achievement. The second key lesson is meaning. Frankl quotes Nietzsche's famous phrase, He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. This means that if someone has a reason to live, then they can bear even the most terrible of experiences. Frankel states that, in, that it is important for one to have a future-oriented goal, which then gives them reason to endure their current suffering and work as best they can towards fulfilling this goal that they have set themselves. Any attempt to restore a man's inner strength in the camp had first to succeed in showing him some future goal. Whenever there was an opportunity for it, one had to give them a why, an aim for their lives in order to strengthen them to bear the terrible how of their existence. Here we can clearly see how important it is for a man to find a future goal for himself. It is this that allows him to cultivate his inner strength that will allow him to endure his suffering and retain the spiritual freedom that allows him to choose his attitude to any given set of circumstances. We just talked about the importance of meaning for the individual, but where do we find this meaning? Is it one meaning for everyone, or do we choose our own? Frankl concludes that it is up to us to determine our own meaning in life, otherwise it would be just like asking the chess master what the best move in chess is. There clearly is no single best moves, it depends on the situation. Frankl gives us a recontextualization of a commonly posed question. We need to stop asking about the meaning of life and instead think of ourselves as those who are being questioned by life daily and hourly. It is therefore up to us to actively create and pursue our own meaning rather than passively waiting for life to randomly provide it to us. It is important to realise that every person will choose a different meaning and so no man and no destiny can be compared with any other man or any other destiny. Another key point we need to look at in order to fully understand Frankl's idea of meaning is the interconnectedness between one's pursuit of meaning and the great deal of tension that will certainly be involved in the journey. Our vision for life should not aim at having the most relaxed life possible, but should focus on having a purposeful struggle throughout. This idea links to Frankl's assertion in the book that happiness and pleasure should not be pursued as a goal in and of themselves but rather that they should ensue from the pursuit of a meaningful and purposeful goal, which itself will be greater than the mere fulfilment of hedonistic pleasures. This state of tension that will accompany our striving is actually needed to propel us forward to become greater and more fulfilled beings. Part of this tension will require sacrifice. This is incredibly important, as it should be our priority to focus on the giving of ourselves self-sacrifice for example, as opposed to just mindlessly gratifying ourselves with hedonistic pleasures. What is to give light must endure the burning. This profound quote is saying that if one is going to give themselves fully, truthfully and passionately to the world by pursuing what is meaningful to them and spreads love to others during the process, it may very well be likely that it will be met with resistance by others and a great deal of tension will be involved in order to commit oneself 
so fully to their newfound meaning. Tension will be an inherent part of the pursuit of meaning, but it is needed for the journey to have any significance. This pursuit of meaning and of truth, despite the tension, may also inspire others to do the same and find their own meaning. Although Frankel insists that we choose our meaning for ourselves, he recommends that our goal is focused on love, particularly of a universal and spiritual kind, and not a lust for power. He states that love is the ultimate and the highest goal to which man can aspire. If we place love as our supreme goal, then it will make sure that we do not become corrupt and manipulative in the pursuit of our goals, and it ensures that we learn to be compassionate and sympathetic towards others around us. Love is the only way to grasp another human being in the innermost core of his personality. No one can become fully aware of the very essence of another human being unless he loves him. Frankel tells us a story of a woman who, on her deathbed, realises how much she had not taken spiritual accomplishments seriously in her life, but now, on her deathbed, she had time to contemplate her existence and reality as a whole and she ultimately found and experienced the highest meaning in life, that is, perceiving reality with unconditional love. This idea of universal and unconditional love links strongly to the Buddhist idea of nirvana, more commonly known as enlightenment, and ego death. The ego loves only things that benefit itself. It is a conditional form of love, but through spiritual practices, one can dissolve the ego and open oneself to the unconditional love that is said to be the true nature and meaning of reality. This is the key teaching in many Eastern philosophies, such as Buddhism, Hinduism and Taoism. The last key concept explored in man's search for meaning is Frankl's new school of psychotherapy, which he calls logotherapy. Logotherapy deviates from psychoanalysis insofar as it considers man as a being whose main concern consists in fulfilling a meaning rather than in the mere gratification and satisfaction of drives and instincts or in merely reconciling the conflicts and claims of internal desires. Freud believes in man as pursuing pleasure while Nietzsche and Adler both believe in man as pursuing power. Frankl breaks away from these schools and believes in man as being in pursuit of meaning. Our meaning can be found in three different ways, which we have already discussed. The first being the attitude that one adopts towards unavoidable suffering. The second is creating a work or accomplishing some task. And the final is by experiencing something fully or loving somebody. Thank you for watching and please leave a like and subscribe. See you next time on Feeling Philosophical.